to a well-designed business. My name is Luann Nigara, and I'm so glad you found this podcast. Together with my husband, Vince, and our partner, Bill, we have grown our company, Window Works, from the ground up. So I know and I understand the challenges you face in running your interior design business. I also know that your talent alone isn't enough to ensure your success. So on this podcast, we talk about strategies and practical steps to help you grow your business. But make no mistake about it. We have our share of fun here too, mixed in with those aha moments that I love so much. This isn't fluff. Nobody has time for that. Whether you are a new interior designer or a seasoned designer, I am here to help you create and to manage the kind of interior design firm that you dream of. It's straight talk and it's action. Are you ready? Let's get started. Hi, welcome to A Well-Designed Business. Today, Alex Alonzo joins me. Alex is the principal of Mr. Alex Tate Design. He grabbed my attention when he emailed me and he said to me, I want to share my idea about how in good customer service, you should always say yes, except when you should say no. (laughs) And so I was like, you have my attention. And um, the thing is, Alex has an ABCD approach that he uses when considering a yes or no decision with a client. And I'm pretty sure you're going to like learning about this process as much as I did. Okay. Having this ABCD process ultimately leads to that better experience for his clients, but also for himself and his team. And when you have a moment later after the show, I encourage you to check out Alex's website. His work is fabulous. He has a modern Victorious Victorian style that celebrates the power of storytelling through spaces. He was recently on Bravo's TV hit design competition, Best Room Wins, where his transitional room design earned him a coveted spread in eldecor.com. He is a heck of a smart guy, and I think you will enjoy meeting him as much as I have. Hey, Alex, thanks so much for joining me on A Well-Designed Business today. Hi, Luann. So excited to be here. Well, first of all, I just want to give you a big high five for putting up with me for the last two and a half weeks. I've had to reschedule you more times, I think, than any guest on the planet, but I appreciate (laughs) it so much. I have had my share of technical difficulties in the last two weeks with my computer, and it kept rearing its ugly face on your day. (laughs) So um, (laughs) I appreciate that you really are willing to still come to this, um, what it seems like from our pre-air conversation, open-minded and open-hearted and not thinking this lady's out of her damn mind. <laughs> so <laughs> I think we're I think we're all crazy for being interior design, but that's okay. <laughs> right, right, exactly. So so here's the thing. I am really glad that you stuck with me for these last couple of weeks, Alex, because you know, the focus of the show today is talking about in your experience how you have managed to create the best client experience slash journey for your clients. And what's you know, you, you said to me that your mantra is always say yes, but know when to say no. And um, this is the tricky, slippery slope of when you up level to it's it's this tricky slope at any level of business and, and customer service we know that but especially when you up level and you are you know serving a higher level clientele that expects more and more yeses than they do knows right mm-hmm. absolutely and i think that you know when we talk about the client experience it's always about expectations right? Like so one client's expectations of what a good level of service is will be different from another client's expectations of what a good you know, level of service may be. So I think as a studio, it's important for you to just identify what you think is a good level of experience for a client, right? Especially someone who is paying for your services. And so for me, when I, when I first launched the studio, I, I thought it was very important to think of what that client experience should be, but how do we contextualize it? How do we actually um, define it a little bit better? And what I found to be very helpful um, was to chart out, if you will, what the client journey is. From the moment you get that first email, that text, that Instagram message, that, you know, that phone call, what, that's when the expectations start to be set with the client. 
And so I, I always try to think about it as what are all the different touch points that a client can reach out to us by, and then what happens from then all the way through you close the deal on the proposal to start kicking off the project, right? That's, that's kind of like the, the heavy lifting, right? The first part of the dating. Mm. Um, and then obviously, what is the experience afterwards, right? Once you start to really tear down the walls and, you know, start designing for them. So two different phases um, in which the client experience uh, really has to kind of morph through. But it's important that you are confident in terms of what you can deliver at each one of those different stages, right? Mm. So for example, um, we got a call today from a client who was a referral, a potential client. She was a referral. And she had seen some of our work. She had actually been to one of our clients' houses, and she'd seen it. But um, she doesn't really know us from Adam. Um, but we knew she already had some expectations of what our work could be. Mm. But she really didn't know how we work, um, you know, who is in, how large is our firm, um, what are our processes, what is our billing structure, what's any of that sort of stuff like, right? So during that initial call with a client, uh, I always like to think of, and this is going to sound a little cheesy, so bear with me, but I find it to be helpful, right? Mm -hmm. You know, when you're buying a, a diamond and you're looking for the four C's, the color, the cut, the carrot, the clarity, and you know, some sort of algorithm of those four has to make sense for you in order to buy it right. for me, right? For when I'm looking for my diamond client, if you will, I've got my ABCDs, right? I've got my actionability. I've got my budget. I've got a client chemistry. And I've got kind of that design sort of all, all these scores, right? So four different scores, if you will, that I attribute to that initial conversation with the client. So actionability, I, I think immediately of, does this make sense from an actionable standpoint from our studio? Can we, are we at the right stage where we can deliver on what they're looking for? Is it a full house remodel? Maybe we're, we're in the midst of four other full home remodels and we can't take this on. So it's, it wouldn't be right for us to take that on, right? Because then if you do and you end up, you know, kind of failing miserably at it or just kind of pedaling along, the overall expectation of the client starts to really, you know, be tainted by it. Mm. Um, also, at the same time, does the client have unrealistic timing expectations, right? Do they think this is a three to six months job and you're kind of thinking, oh, there's no way in heck this can be done in that amount of time. Mm. It's got to be 12 months to, you know, 16 months. So is it actionable for you uh, and your studio and your firm at the time to be able to do that, right? So that, that to me is, that, that's, that's a, a score that I give that initial call based on what I know at that point, right? The second is budget. Is the budget realistic? And sometimes clients don't want to share the budget. Sometimes they don't know what that budget is. So, and sometimes they will. They will be very upfront and candid about what it is and at that point that's great you can decide whether you think it's realistic or not um, but at the same time if a client isn't willing to share the budget are you comfortable continuing to engage in this conversation without knowing you know what it might be and for some clients it could be that they just don't really know and the budget is it, it will constantly change and evolve and it'll grow but some clients they just don't feel comfortable sharing their numbers so you, I think, as a, as a studio, as a firm, have to decide whether, you know, that's something that you have the overall mental capacity to just bear with, right, until you get there. Client chemistry, the C for me, if you will, is probably one of the most important ones because we've had many clients come to us and say, we looked at your work. Um, it's not really our style, but we hear you guys have got a great process. Um, you execute on time, the team is very professional, blah, 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 this sort of stuff. And, you know, we have great chemistry and we'll decide to do the project, right? Mm -hmm. Even though it's probably not 100% the aesthetic, but we know we can do something cool and something special with them. Mm -hmm. And so we'll take it. But sometimes you have a client early on that you can just, I mean, you just see those red flags. Mm -hmm. You know, those initial conversations are a little bit weird, a little bit tense. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just this past you know, this past week, actually, we turned down two clients. And, and I, I'm not saying this to say like, oh, look at us, we turned down clients. No, mm -hmm. but it's more, it's, it's an uncomfortable, a very uncomfortable situation, right? right. Uh, it's an uncomfortable conversation to have um, with a prospective client, but you have to be very honest. The chemistry wasn't there. Um, you're not getting good vibe. You have to have that level of comfort with them 
through the awkward moments and the good moments in order for there to be really good collaboration, hmm. right? And so I always find that client chemistry, you, you almost can't put a price on it. Of course, we try, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you, but you, you know, you, you, it's extremely important and should not be overlooked. And I think the last one for me is design, right? Uh, as I mentioned, some clients call us and they'll say, you know, we kind of like what you guys do. Not really our style, but, and we'll decide, you know, is it something that we want to do? We want to try something a little bit different or do we want to, you know, do we need to decide as a studio, is this really going to contribute to our portfolio? Is that what we're at right now? Do we need to pay bills? So <laughs> yes, we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. um, or do we have the luxury of just really saying, you know what, it's not a good fit for us right now. Um, or we just, we'll give you our interpretation of, you know, minimalist, which might not be what you're looking for. Um, so therefore it's not a good fit, right? So I, I feel like when we have th this initial call, I'm constantly asking questions to kind of populate this, this report card, if you will, um, early on in terms of whether to help us decide whether we want to take this client on or not. And, and again, this is because we're trying to make sure that we can set the right expectations for the client and that as a studio, as a firm, we are clear about what our expectations are about this project as well. Right. So it kind of, it helps us in both ways. So I feel this is like such a critical step for us early on um, in that client journey perspective um, that really helps us get to the grain in terms of, yeah, this is a great project. And, and you may say like, well, I'm just starting out. I don't necessarily have, uh, you know, I, I don't necessarily have like a huge, when it comes to accountability, I don't have a huge, um, portfolio of work where I've done construction. And so I don't necessarily know whether I can take that scope on or not. It's okay. Hmm. Be honest with yourself. Hmm. If you feel like it's too much for you and the project is heavily, heavily, heavily driven by, you know, architecture, labor and construction, those types of things. And the design is kind of light. Don't take it. Seriously, hmm. do not take it. That is not the right project for you to cut your teeth on. And you need to be very, very honest. So all of this, the, the more honest you are, with yourself uh, about what you can deliver, the better the client experience will be because you'll have the confidence to speak to the clients and say, yes, this is possible, this is not possible. Or you know what, this is why we can't do this for this budget, this is why we need to grow this budget in this, in this particular area. So all of these things are just, they, say, they set the foundation really for what the client experience and client journey will be. So for me, that's the first, the first key critical moment of the client journey. I, this is, I mean, I'm like over here doing my happy dance. There is nothing <laughs> that I love better than taking the, you know, answer to how do you decide which is the right client out of the, I don't know, you just kind of know to something very specific that everyone can kind of run down this ABCD list. And so I have a few questions within everything you just discussed, Alex. The first question is, is this um, have, first of all, I, I actually, before I ask a question, I want to say this is in action. You've told me you listen to the show. This is the in live action, the definition of what I always say, know what you will do and know what you will not do before you go into anything, whether it's a negotiation, it's going into a discovery call with a client. This is the epitome of know what we will do as a firm and what we will not do. And what I know about that sentence that I say on the show over and over again is because if you have that clarity for yourself in whatever situation it is, you are not on the fly trying to decide, should I, should I, shouldn't I, should I, shouldn't I? It's like, no, that, that didn't check that box. It's a no. That check, so now getting, setting that as a, as a, a statement, I want to know, do you, do all four of these have to be a check? Yes. Or is there, so, is it a time, is there times when you're like, hmm, you know what, when I go into these conversations, three out of four out of four home run yay three out of four probably yes two out of two probably no one out of out of i mean two yeah two over two no one out of four absolutely no and zero out of four why are we still ask, asking ourselves a question <laughs> like how do you how do you do that is there any wiggle room or is it you need an absolute check yes for all four so it's funny that you asked that because i've been doing this since i i started the firm since I started the studio. And I can tell you that early on when we had zero clients, mm. it was a check mark. 
right? It was a check mark here or a thumbs up here or whatever the case, you know, whatever little sticker you want to use. Uh -huh. As we've kind of grown the business, I attribute a number to it. Uh -huh. One to five. Five would be the best. Zero would be the worst, obviously. And so it becomes a little bit more mathematical. And I'm sorry if this is getting a little heady. But because design can be so subjective, I like to root our decisions in numbers, mm -hmm. right? Because like I, you always say you have to do the autopsy, right? right? This to me is, and we call it our postmortem, right? Mm -hmm. So this is when, when you were in, when you were in grade school, you had, you know, you had your report card at the beginning of the year, and then you had a report at the end of the year. This is kind of what I look at beginning of the call. This is, we set this up. And so now that I'm several years into this, we attract, we attribute a number to it, right? So if we say, you know what, actionability, yes, we can definitely do this. That's a five. Or if we're feeling kind of like, gosh, there's a lot on our plate right now. It would be great if we could do it, but okay, it's a four, right? Um, budget is the budget. Does a budget sound realistic? Is it great? That's a one. I mean, sorry, that's a five. If it's unrealistic, maybe it's a zero or a, you know, or a one. Mm. Um, and client chemistry, we, we just couldn't stop talking. Client chemistry was great off the charts. That's a five. Um, and then the, the design aesthetic, you know what? We've done a little bit of that. We feel comfortable. It could be a good portfolio booster for us. Um, it takes us a little bit, you know, helps us evolve a little bit. You know, let's give that a, a four, a three and a half. And so you kind of add these up, if you will. And then you come up with what's the right number for you, right? So mm -hmm. I think over the years, I've kind of perfected this a little bit, to be mm -hmm. honest with you. And then if I get anything above, like on a project call, if it's 80 plus or above, to me, that seems like it's kind of a go. We may mm -hmm. have a couple more questions to go for, but we feel comfortable that because we know projects in the past that have rated 80% or above have worked out for us, mm -hmm. right? Um, things below, probably not. So it's about setting you know, setting the groundwork for what you will ultimately evolve, right, as a tool that you can use as part of your autopsy, <laughs> you know, your, I love it. later on. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I really do love it. I think it's so, um, it's so clear. And I love that it's something that, well, first of all, that you are actually, you know, it's funny because a lot of people, let's be real, say, I, you know, any number of people could say that they have this system exactly as you laid it out. And then, but they don't actually then rate it and put the numbers to it, number one. So it's like, ah, at the end of the day, yeah, A, B, C, D, I think it, they, they were all pretty good. Okay, let's do it. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, it's like, <laughs> you know, you, you do that. You do the vagueness of it. And then to take it to the next level where you actually review your projects at the end. So at the beginning, we said this was a 90 five percent at the end would we say it was a 95 percent did we make a good decision right because now you're mm -hmm. like really recognizing are we not being critical enough in certain areas because how did this go off the rails if we said we said this was a 95 percent right yep yep well and and i think also that it doesn't help you to be soft with yourself no you know and we can always be our hardest critics mm -hmm. i get it you don't you don't want to overly beat yourself up i mean it, but you have to be honest and you have to be real Mm -hmm. about all these things because you know what at the end of the day this is a business mm -hmm. and if your business isn't growing then quite frankly sometimes you really can't look anywhere but internally in terms of why it's not mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so you've got to have clarity in terms of your numbers you have to have clarity in terms of what you your competencies and your accountability and so i think it all starts with you know you setting the example because at the end of the day the best the best response you're ever going to get is a client referring you to someone else and raving about you and then that project you can hand it off to your PR team and they're gonna just market the heck out of it you know and, and it's just gonna be never-ending and giving but it has to be rooted in a process that kind of gets you to picking the right one because this is I mean at the end of the day and this is I think the hardest part for some clients to really understand is and we actually put this in our document so when we first chat with a client we will send them a document that is our studio FAQs our frequently asked questions it's about 30 pages of questions that they might Whoa. have 30 in, pages oh yeah it, it's a lot <laughs> everything from like how we bill and why we bill and why we charge for a consultation and all this all the stuff you don't even you know think about wow. we're like if you might have a question and this took us months to put together by the way but yeah. we send it to them because we're setting the expectation that we're thorough we expect you to read it and if you don't read it that's on you that's not on us you've right. been disclosed you know right. this has been disclosed um but at the same time we want them we want there to be full transparency as far as everything is concerned, as far as we do, we are setting the example that we are transparent, 
<laughs> that we are very accountable for the work that we do. We stand behind it and we expect that of you as well. Wow. Right. And so it's, it's incumbent upon us to set the groundwork for the conversation. But in that FAQs, we even, we put out there just like, do you ever turn away business? And we say, absolutely. Because this is all getting us to a place where, you know, it's a business. Yes. At the end of the day, but it is a relationship. Mm -hmm. And design is extremely personal. Mm -hmm. And you've got to make sure that you are both meshing and jiving and like the chemistry is there. And, and it's great. It's not to say that it's going to be uncomfortable at times. Of course, every relationship has its, you know, discomforts. But on the whole, you want it to be positive. So we make it very clear that just because you've reached out to us, um, not because we're arrogant, not because of any other reason other than we're honestly trying to protect each other, mm -hmm. we may turn this business down. And we had a couple of weeks ago, we actually had a client moving from the West Coast here, um, new house for them and their family. Uh, we went through all these ABCDs, if you will, right? The budget was good. You know, the design, not so great. Mm. Actionability, they came around to the timing mm. and the client chemistry was pretty poor. Mm. And quite frankly, we said, let's pass. Mm. We have to pass. And we reached out to them and said, like, you know what? Before we take this any further, we have to just take ourselves out of the running. Mm -hmm. And they were upset. We got an email from them saying like, I can't believe this. Uh, you guys weren't even the cheapest ones. Um, but we liked your process. We liked everything. We thought, you know, we thought we were going in a good direction and we thought blah, blah, blah. And we said like, I, I don't know. It sounds like they misread the conversation, you know, misread the engagement. So <laughs> like I'm dying over here. I'm like, and, and so what? Like, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we're like, but, but you were going to, I hate to say it this way, but you were going to make us, you and I were both going to be miserable during this whole process, yeah. you know, because we, we got the general sense that the timing from them was actually pretty tight, even though they said that they could, you know, they could find it's OK. We could we could work with it being available in six months, but really wanted it available at like three and a half to four months. And we're right. Like, right. Oof. Right. We know you're never going to get past that. You know what I'm saying? Right. And we're like, you can just tell it, you know, mm -hmm. especially there's a baby on the way. We're like, oh, oh, no. right. Yeah. You're going to be baby. flexible with this. <laughs> Right, right. We're, I mean, it's, it's no. So we honestly did it because we don't feel it's going to be the right client experience for them. We always tell clients like, we want you to absolutely dive into this. This should be fun. Okay. Yeah, yeah. This should not be painful. This should be fun. We should like talking to each other. Um, and so it shouldn't be anything that you're just kind of like, oh, I don't want to call those guys again because they're right. late, you know, right, right. so. So let me ask you, I, I mean, honestly, I have 20 questions written down from everything you're saying. You're so smart. I love it. But right there in that piece, I love the line. We have to take ourselves out of the running for this project. So, you know, I love that. It's like you're taking the action. Right. And I, I love that. Instead of I'm not I'm not accepting you. We're declining you. We're taking ourselves out of the running for this project. It just has a little bit more um, elegance to it. But when they came back to you, Alex, and they were like, I can't believe it, you know, blah, 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 all the things. Now you got to go back with a little bit more directness. So, you know, especially, you know, like the things that you were saying, they said, it's sort of like, that's all about you, whatever. I, I, I don't right, like great, but not affecting my decision. So how do you, how did you come back and answer that finally, you know, there? Truthfully, I didn't. Oh, you just the, let it sit. It's like, you're crazy I, pants. And I, you're now yelling at me. We haven't even started working. And this is why. I'm not right. taking I mean, the project. <laughs> so you've, you've clearly just proven why we didn't. Exactly. <laughs> right. So it's like, okay, a moment of introspection for you. Uh, <laughs> you know, hope you're receiving this moment. This was free for you. Um, but I, but honestly, like, I feel that sometimes there's no reason to get into that back and forth. Yeah. That's then, what I was like. Cause right. you don't strike yeah. me as somebody that's going to get into a nonsensical back and forth. So I was curious. Yeah. Oh no, I, I let it, I let it ride because quite frankly, there really weren't any open questions to us. Right. And that's what I always look for. It, it's more like, okay, you're venting that you're upset. And yeah. I can't, I can't help you with that. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I it, it is what it is, yeah. you know? Um, and so I just kind of let it sit. Now, if there is, if there's a question in there, like, is there anything we can do to kind of have you reconsider? Mm. Then I will engage in, well, these are the things that unfortunately for us don't necessarily work. And then, you know, we let them know, but our decisions, and this has happened before, by the way. Oh, we had a client once 
with her husband on the phone and they were crying and they couldn't believe it. And he was a lawyer. He had read. I mean, it was it was a nightmare. It was a nightmare. I was like, oh, my God, you have so proven us right right now. But (laughs) and it was a crazy budget. It was a beautiful house. And we're just like disaster averted. Let's go all have like a cocktail. Um, and And like three days later, he wrote me again saying, like, I can't believe this, even though after we had ended the call with, like, I completely respect your decision, all this good stuff, he came back again, and I was, like, not responding to it. And then three days later, he came back again, and I'm like, okay, I'm done. Now we do have to talk about this. Yes. <laughs> so, yes. you know, but um, so sometimes it can go a little bit left and go super crazy. Um, it doesn't happen. Usually clients, you know, kind of acknowledge the fact right. that- Right, these are the rarer cases, right? Like, yeah. they're the fun ones, though. They're the ones that we're all going to write our books about one day. <laughs> oh, totally. totally. Well, and here's the thing. I would much rather have horror stories even before starting a project than during a project, even oh, though I have right. my fair share of those. Sure. But um, if we can avoid the disaster, I mean, listen, at the end of the day, I'm not writing fiction here. I mean, I, I wish I was still working for Hollywood, but I'm not. Like, <laughs> I, I, I'm truly just- I want a business. I want people to have a good time. I want stuff to get, you know, published and clients to be ecstatic and rave about it. Like, I don't, I don't need any more fodder for, you know, for novels I'll never write. Right, right. So when, um, when it's funny, because I don't want to just talk about this one situation, but each time there's a little nuance in there that I think is helpful for the rest of us. So when, they come back and they have the one question in there and it's like, you know, how could we get this back on track or how, what would it take for you to take our project? If the, the client, is there ever a situation where do you then say, well, for example, the, what, the, one of the reasons that we declined this or we're having to say no is because, um, you're, the, the budget of $100,000 in our experience is unrealistic and it's honestly going to take probably two to 250, right? Or mm-hmm. your timeline of um, under saying six months is okay, but needing three, I know six could be nine, six is not going to be three, right? Like, do you ever do that? And then somebody says, well, I actually have 250. I'll, I will do it with 250. And then you're like, well, that was the only you thing know. that really made me crazy. So yes, I can do it. Or no, we get it. We've talked to our parents. We're going to live with our parents for three months or we re- found a rental for six months. It's fine. We're off the ledge. We really want you. Or are you like, no, you're nuts. I'm out. Yeah. I never go back. You when never we're go done, back. Okay. We're done. No, 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 no. Like, listen, when I break up with someone, we're, we're like, we're, it. there's no, you don't buy Talk me to chocolate. The hand. It's over. No, 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 no. You don't. Yeah. You don't take me out to a fancy dinner and try to make up. It's over. Like, and I don't want to sound that way, but, but it's true because listen, yeah. they showed you, their colors, you, right? They've showed their colors. You've withheld information and we're already kind of starting off. We came with the best intentions forward and mm-hmm. you know, you kind of thought perhaps I, I, it just doesn't feel right with me. And I think it's important as a studio to, or as a firm to really, stand behind your word as, you know, as a collective team, mm. you know, and, and I think reconsidering very seldomly happens, mm. you know, to be honest with you. The only time I think that we've ever reconsidered was when it was a repeat client and, you know, something they wanted, uh, you know, us to complete a project very quickly or, and we just couldn't do it. And then we said, okay, maybe we can move things around. Maybe we can sneak it in. But that's because we knew who we were getting in bed mm. with, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but if it's a cold call, someone, you know, we don't really know, you, there's so many things that can go wrong with it that we're just like, we're better off saying no, um, letting them cool off and then just moving on. Mm-hmm. Well, and I love what you, what you said in there. You said they withheld information from you. And so, like I said, if the example was, well, we said a hundred, but we can really come up with two fifty, or we said it had to be three to six, but we can live with the six to nine. It, I love that you, you identified that as the actual problem, not that, they thought that with a hundred was, you know, was fine. And if they have two fifty, but that they withheld information at the moment when you were talking to them and they were saying a hundred and you were saying two fifty. if in the original conversation, if they had, I'm imagining if they had said something like, well, we did hope it was a hundred, but with two fifty, we got it right. Like that's mm-hmm. not withholding in your, you're saying right. we've already started and you are, you're, you're positioning lying and all the things. And how is, how, where is this going to go from here? Right. Exactly. I mean, and again, did you not read our 30 page frequently asked questions? We've put everything on the table. Like, I mean, you know, exactly my shirt size, (laughs) you know, (laughs) I mean, you know, everything. So um, what gives you the impression that, you know, we don't expect the same level of, you know, reciprocity or transparency from you? Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. Now, going back to the ABCDs, 
Um, you said something interesting in the budget conversation when you said budget. You said, first of all, you want to know if they have a realistic budget. But then you said sometimes they're not willing to share or they don't actually know what it is. And I don't recall. Um, oh, I know what you said after that. You said something to the effect of, and in some cases I can, can, I can decide to continue on without that information. And so I was curious, does that mean that you're getting a genuine sense of both that there is from whatever else you're learning in the conversation that there is possibly, there's other indicators that there's money here that they probably have the budget and that they also genuinely really don't know what it could be. So they're not being, um, they're not withholding information, but they haven't learned enough yet to say what they're willing to spend. Like, tell me what you meant in there. Yeah. So we've had clients that truthfully they've moved from, you know, New York to here, they've moved from a smaller town, you know, to Miami and, they just don't know. They don't know what the costs of labor might be for construction or wallpaper and things like that. So it's, I can't necessarily hold them accountable for that, for withholding. They just, they just genuinely do not know. However, I will not let the question slide, right? Mm -hmm. I will continue to try to get an answer somehow. So I'll say, so typically our master bedrooms, when we design them, given the size of yours and kind of what we've discussed are anywhere between 80 to $150,000. That's kind of where the budget's lie. If I come to you with a budget like that, are you okay with that? Mm. And then I, re and I feel them out, but it's about knowing your numbers, right? And I'll say our typical living rooms are anywhere between X and X, right? Is that a comfortable number for you? And so even though they don't have the exact data in front of them, the exact numbers that they like, I want to start presenting them with numbers and I'm, and I'll preamble and say, that's not to say that yours is going to be at the higher end, mm -hmm. but we know we can do beautiful rooms or the rooms that you've seen on our website are between this and this range, just so that you get, get a general ballpark in terms of how we play. Right. Um, and I, I try to get to, I try to get as much budget out of them as possible. Also, I start to ask them like, so what type of brands do you like? What type of furniture stores do you typically shop or how did you outfit your previous home? And they will know brands and some clients say, Oh, I think we bought a Roche Beauvoir sofa. Uh, probably eight years ago, it was really comfortable. It was a big splurge. Um, I don't know that I would do it again. Mm. That's very telling, right? right? Or like, it was a great sofa. It's still standing up straight. In fact, I think I love it so much. We're happy if we dump a couple more money and reupholster it, you know? Mm -hmm. So we have this beautiful dining room table that we bought is a Biedermeyer, you know, whatever the case, we, whatever. Right. So I think you have to try to be smart about how you get answers to that budget question because it's an uncomfortable question to ask. But it's a very important one because it helps also define what the expectations are later on. Hmm. I have to say that's two times you've hit me with the only thing I can think of is such an elegant wording. It really is the way you're saying when you said, if I come to you, know, our, our bedrooms you know, typically run to 80 to 150K. When you look at our website, the work that you see, this is the range. And if I come to you with a number like that, are you going to be comfortable with that? That is... That's just, that's a priceless line. Like, write it down, everybody. I love this line. <laughs> you know, because I, you know, Alex, I'm always processing what you guys are saying to me as a consumer, right? Because I'm not an interior mm -hmm. designer. So I process, like, if somebody hit me with that line, what do I think? And sometimes I honestly mm -hmm. will be sitting here thinking, don't hit me with that line, because that's not going to land good, right? But that line <laughs> literally... It, it, it gives, it respects me. It doesn't say, well, when I design, my bedrooms are usually 150,000. Can you afford that? <laughs> like, like right? right? It's just like, right. it's so, it says the same thing, but it says, you know, this is what I know from my experience, my data. We don't have to say all those crazy words, but this is what's the truth about my work. You were attracted to my work and now let's talk about the truth about it. This is the truth about it. And I love when you say, if I come to you with a number like this, is it something you're comfortable with? Because I can look at you and say, yeah, I'm in the wrong spot. <laughs> I'm like, no, right. Right? right? Or I can say to your point, well, it'd be great if it were at the lower end number, but I get it, right? I, mm -hmm. I got it, right? And yes. you can tell, I, I know you can tell, you're very skilled at communication. That's so clear that you're so skilled at this, but you know, you can tell regardless of what comes out of their mouth, I'm a hundred percent sure you're going to parse through an actual true meaning in their words. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and, and, and so here's the thing. Many times people don't sit down and itemize how much went into their bedroom, mm. right? Because they're, they're like, oh, I need a bed. They'll go out and buy a bed. And maybe like seven, eight months or next year, they'll buy like, oh, I really need a better dresser. So when you actually start to do the math and putting it all together all at once, you're just like, well, guess what? That's kind of what it costs. You know? and, <laughs> and, and you can even say like, listen, let's, let's run through the example. Let's go to Crate and Barrel. Yes. Let's buy you a bed at Crate and Barrel. And then you get the nightstands and then you get the rugs and then you get the window treatments, which I know you know really well, Julian. And then you get all the decor and then you get the lighting and then you get the table lamps and then you, where are you at? Yeah, at a crate and barrel, you're at 50 grand, let alone some high end luxury designer, right? Exactly, exactly. So once you kind of start to educate them a little bit on that, then it becomes like, oh, I get it. I can see how it adds up very quickly. Mm -hmm. And at that point, they kind of respect you a little bit more because it's like you're, you're, putting, it ev you're putting everything on the table. And you're like, listen, I just want to be frank and honest with you. This is what it could potentially cost because I don't want money to be the stress point. I want you to be stressed out about, oh, my gosh, all these options are gorgeous. I don't know which one to pick rather mm -hmm. than like, oh, wow, I want to pick this one, but I can't afford it. Right. I love horrible. this. I don't want right? money to be the stress point. That's so good, too. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and I always tell clients, you don't need us to help you spend money. Clearly, you know how to do that well. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you need us to help you spend money smartly and strategically. And some things are going to be investment for you and some things are not. Hmm. And we just need to know from you, what are those elements that are going to be investment pieces for you and that you're comfortable with? Mm -hmm. um, and we can respect, but then we need to decide as a studio that works for us or you know what? It doesn't work for us. We right. can't high low mix it. And some of it we're like, of course we love to high low mix it. Yeah, let's go, you know, let's go flea bark shop. We'll find a couple of really great pieces for you. You know, we may be in that vibe. But we may not be right. So um, I think it's about feeling out the client when it comes to budget and really, really making them think about it, because a lot of them are just like, oh, I don't know. It's OK. The budget. Um, Yeah, you know, it's flexible. I know what I like, what I see it. If we fall in love with it, you know, we'll buy it. And it's like, oh, geez, those are so vague. No, yes. no, 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 no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's awesome. And I remember the first time somebody did do that little exercise on the show pointing out you know hey mm -hmm. add up everything in your living room now and i'm thinking you know what i don't even spend money on this stuff and you're right <laughs> it adds up to a lot of money <laughs> but you know you do it over weeks and months and it's like whatever right um and so it does yeah. and it makes perfect sense and what happens is the, the when i hear that as a consumer when you you know tactfully and gently walk me through an exercise like that it makes me understand Oh, right. If I wanted to do this again on my own at Crate and Barrel, I'm going to spend 50 if I'm going to do it all. But I called you because this time I was really ready to make the investment and do it right and have a beautiful home. And how did I think it was not going to cost more? Of course, it's going to cost more. And so now all of a sudden, your 85, 150 doesn't seem so extravagant anymore because that is the thing, right? And, and look, when you are established like you are and you are attracting firmly the luxury client you're not doing as much my guess alex as educating anymore the client but when we are still dealing with the client that is reaching to luxury right like they think mm -hmm. oh yeah i'm a grown-up now i you know this is my real house and we're going to do this and i'm i'm going to get a designer sometimes you know that client even though they have some coins right right mm -hmm. yep. but they get surprised they get yep. like they get a little like oh I didn't think mm -hmm. it was going to be that much. And, right. and, and what happens is if you have that sensibility, a little bit of, no, I'm at the point in station in life where I could afford, and this is my decision, but you're too snooty. It's like mm -hmm. that makes it, oh, right. No, 85 to 150 when you are coming to a high end and you're going to get beautiful quality pieces and not just you know, the stuff on the furniture floor, store, store floor. Yes. Now it doesn't seem like you're just, Oh, I'm just expensive. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's it, there's a justification yep. or rationalization that a consumer can sink their teeth into. Yeah. Well, and, and listen, I'll be the first one to say, um, listen, I, I didn't come from money. Um, I, my parents never hired a designer. Mm -hmm. So I, I didn't even, I came a very non-traditional way into design. Right. Um, so, for me, it is, it is an honor, it is a privilege, um, and it's a treat 
mm-hmm. right, to work with clients who appreciate design. And I always try to make the conversation about design and less about the money, mm. you know, especially when it comes to clients, because they are paying for a, a unique point of view on a space, right? Um, and, and also, obviously, to execute on that vision, right? So it, that's kind of your IP. So when we talk about budgets with clients, I, I always try to take the conversation away from less about the it's going to be a, a luxury room for you. It's this and that, because those terms of luxury and big budgets and small budgets are all extremely relative. Mm-hmm. I had a client that we first took on. It was a beautiful house, modern house. And the budget started out at two hundred and eighty thousand dollars. I think it was. Hmm. We're we're now at one point five million dollars. Okay, um, and it has just. It, it, I mean, it, it's a treat, right? But it hmm. comes with its own set of, you know, expectations, right? We're looking for those unique pieces. We're taking time with it. The budget, the project has taken, you know, three times as long, hmm. right? So for us, it, it really is about what that overall experience with the client is and how we get there. And many times I don't make it about like, oh, well, we can go to this particular luxury brand. We can go to Holly Hunt and pick you a, you know, $25,000 Vladimir Kagan sofa, and then we'll get another $15,000 Holly Hunt table. Like we always try to tell clients very humbly, (laughs) because again, I didn't grow up in this privileged world that it really is, this is your money and Mm -hmm. we spend your money like it's our money. Mm -hmm. So Uh, We try to be as judicious with it as much as possible. Um, But at the same time, we know that we're going to present you with things. You may fall in love with it. Those are your tough decisions to make. Mm. Right. So for me, it's not like, oh, gosh, I know these clients can pay. Let's let's get the most expensive thing. Let's constantly recommend the most expensive thing. That's kind of a disservice also to the client. Right. Because it's not your money and it's their money. And you have to be very, very, very humble about it. Because, again, it is a privilege and an honor to spend someone's money and to be paid for doing something like we do right which is designing a beautiful space and they put so much trust in you that you really do have to take that to heart so it can't just be about like ah these guys are loaded let them pay i i I would hate for someone to think that about me number one because i'm not loaded but number two because you know i just think it's it's so foolish i actually went to a showroom once i'm sorry i ramble i went to a showroom once and we were looking at stone samples and the rep told me she's like well and i asked her i'm like so how much is you know this how much are these slabs of marble and all the good stuff? What's my trade price? And then she's like, oh, it's X. And she's like, do your clients have money? You can mark it up three times. And I thought mm-hmm. to myself, oh, I was so disgusted with that that wow. I was like, I'm out. Yeah, I'm yeah. out. I'll go buy it. I'll go buy it elsewhere. Yeah. You know, and, and I just didn't, I didn't like that experience. I'm like, if that's what you're thinking, you know, like, yeah. I, I'm just so put off by it. Right. And right. so I, when we built the studio, and by the way, this whole client journey, client experience, the ABCDs, This took us months to come to, Mm. right? We did all of this even before we started marketing the studio. Wow. This this took us like eight months. And again, my background is I worked in corporate for a long time. I worked in entertainment. Um, So I knew marketing. I knew branding. Uh, My husband's very good with business. So we really tried to make sure we built a business similar to how we would want to be treated. Mm. So if we were ever going to hire a designer, how would we want to be treated? What are, what's the level of transparency that we feel comfortable with? What's the pricing model that feels fair to us? Um, you know, and then just uh, we just kind of built it that way organically, right? Mm-hmm. Just from a very humble standpoint of we didn't know what you're supposed to charge. We don't know, you know, we don't know a lot of things. Um, so we literally we heard a lot of your podcasts. We heard a lot of other podcasts. We read a lot of books, a lot of you know blogs, and we just kind of cobbled it together, right? Um, and that's how we. That's kind of how we built it. That's how we did it. And it sounds very commonsensical, if you will. But quite frankly, I didn't know any other way of doing it. Mm. Because I, I didn't have formal training in terms of, you know, having a business and in, in design or having studied design. So I knew I had a good eye for it. And I had always been a lifelong passion. I've been doing it on the side. But after so many years in corporate, I'm like, you know what? I've been in enough boardroom meetings. I've been in enough pitch meetings. I know that I can put together a business that I can feel confident about, that I know can be honest, can be transparent. Um, But let me build it through the lens as if I were the consumer. Mm. And that's kind of helped us build the overall journey overall. Like what are, what do I expect at this point of the process? And now at this point, and now at that point, and then subsequently like that. I love that part. I love that part because that is the, it's so funny because there are opinions in the industry that if you're not 
an interior designer with a d design background that, you know, maybe you're not as effective as a coach or a consultant for interior designers. And, you know, yes, there are some blind spots when you're not. But for me, I think it serves me and the people that I work with so well. And to your exact point, it's what is the consumer journey? And so for you to build your your whole business model on at this stage, what do I need to understand what's happening? What do I need to be clear about what the deliverables are? What do I need to experience, you know, satisfaction at this stage? God forbid, what do I need at this stage to have happiness and joy, you know, <laughs> from the standpoint of the client? And then at this stage, because, you know, that that is the whole thing. When you build it so it's it's gettable, right? You get it. Yep. 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 <laughs> you know, I just had an experience yesterday with one of my chairman of the boards and I said to her, walk me through. I'm, I'm hi. I'm Luann. I heard about you on Instagram. Love your work. How do you work? And, you know, we just walk through it. And it, over the course of an hour, you know, you, you start to realize how we all do this, right? I'm sure I do this in my own business as well. But the first three or four times the question is answered, not answering the question I'm asking, <laughs> right? right? Because mm -hmm. you, you have these things, well, I want to tell you about this and I want to tell you about this. And I just gently was saying, mm -mm, that's not what I'm asking you here. I'm asking you this direct question. And, and the thing was, I understood that I was asking her a question that was not answerable at that point. I get that. I know enough about it to know. But <laughs> I was like, but you got to give me something to hang on to and let me know through your expertise why it's not answerable at this point instead yeah. of just closing me down, right? And so I love that you built this business. It's so funny because you say, you know, you cobbled it together. Okay, Mr. <laughs> Humble. <laughs> I just cobbled it together by listening to a couple of podcasts and reading some blogs. Okay. <laughs> listen, it, it took us months. Yeah. I'll be, listen, yeah. it took us months of doing a lot, a lot. Like if you... And again, you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. So let's tap into the things that you do know, mm. right? I do know uh, how to put a business plan together because, you know, I, I've been doing that in corporate for such a long time, right? I know how marketing works. I know, you know, cost per click and I know CPMs and I know, you know whatever. I know media. Great. I don't know necessarily what happens when you meet with a client. I don't know how to open trade accounts. I don't mm -hmm. know how to, you know what I'm saying? So the best thing that you can do is obviously just try to get as smart about it as quickly as possible, right? But at the same time, for me, it was, okay, we don't have to rush this. We don't have to launch this studio tomorrow. Um, we would love to, um, but how long is it going to take us to do it and get it to a point where we feel we're comfortable, that we can answer questions, we can be competent, and we can be a resource? Mm. So I, I, it, it took us time to come up with all of this stuff. And it wasn't perfect. I'll be honest with you. We introduced a lot of things early on from a client journey that we thought would be great tools and documents and things like that. And we've fine tuned it. We said like, we don't need that document. Nope. That document's too much. That's superfluous. Oh, you know what? We need this document here. And so we're constantly optimizing that process because the process is very, very important. And mm -hmm. I know you've had a lot of podcasts about processes and studio processes. And I think that that's something that should never be overlooked. I love it. I love it. Honest to God, I am torn between, you know, extending this another 25 minutes <laughs> and letting you go. <laughs> uh, honestly, it's just uh, so uh, refreshing to speak with you, Alex. And I am really even now way more grateful that you put up with my <laughs> technical difficulties over the last couple of weeks, because um, what it is, is it's that we always say, when you actually know with complete certainty that you're delivering good, you're delivering a, you know, a great experience, you're delivering a great um, outcome, you're delivering a great process, then your confidence skyrockets because, and the, and the things that you, when you hear a no in your head, you're okay with a no. When you hear a yes in your head, you're okay with a yes because it's based on absolute you know, intrinsic knowledge. But the thing is, it's it's few and far between to get to really hear that in somebody. And I hear that in you. And I just um, think it's so uh, awesome that, you know, and I love that you said, look, not everything worked, 
right? So if someone out there is listening and they just fell on their face yesterday or today and, you know, something blew up in a process, you know, just stand up, just, you know, mm -hmm. do it again, fix it. We, we're yeah. all like, I mean, our, our processes and procedures for every, every one of us that runs a seasoned business, it is a living, breathing thing, process and procedures, right, Alex? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, listen, you are a very different person year one of mm -hmm. your studio or your firm than you are year two, year three, year four, because your business is changing, your clients mm -hmm. are getting different, your budgets are evolving, um, mm -hmm. your staff is just changing and evolving as well. So everything, and, and then you've got COVID, right? So that'll happen. <laughs> so that, that'll completely destroy everything. But, you know, you, you have to be able, you have to just be flexible with it, mm -hmm. but you have to at least, you have to know where you're starting from in order to you know, to adjust, because sometimes you don't need to adjust everything in the process. Mm. It, it might just be tweaks. It doesn't need to be an, a major overhaul, right? Right, right? So you just have to be able to be so fine tuned with the different parts of your business that you know which are the ones that are probably squeaking a little bit that need to be addressed and which are the ones that can run the course. Right, right. Oh, my goodness. So good. I have to say thank you so much. Um, you know, when whenever I'm any place and you know I'm there, would you please introduce yourself to me? So, um, I just um, really, really enjoyed our conversation, Alex, and I'm 100 percent that it's going to be valuable. And you've got a lot of designers out there thinking, oh, whoa, I, A, B, C, D. That's so clear. I can work with that. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Of course, my pleasure. Anytime. I look forward to part two with you. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> So when Alex started his firm, he thought to himself, every client will have an expectation of a high level of service. But he also realized they'd all be different in what that meant to them. So he asked himself, what does good service look like to me? And what would be the best way to create that client experience that is elevated? What are the areas where each client has their expectations and how much can I deliver within each of those areas and how can I up level it, right? So the thing is though, he came up with this ABCD strategy for evaluating each client before working together, right? This is this is essential, first of all, because if you want to deliver a good experience, you have to make sure you're working with the right person. But when he talked about his ABCD strategy, it hit me this is essentially his way to in getting to what I always tell you to do, which is know what you will do and what you will not do, right? When you think about this, when you think about what you will do and what you will not do for all the major areas of your business and your life, it always makes it so much easier in the moment to make clear decisions. We are way less likely to be persuaded to do something we'd rather not. We are less likely to attach emotions to the choice that we have in front of us. And we are less likely to compromise our ideals in the moment that a decision needs to be made because we've already established what we will and we will not do. By deciding and developing ahead of time his ABCD strategy, Alex learns right from the beginning if someone is a good fit or not. When you're just starting out, we understand, all of us do, it's tempting to take on everything. And, you know, to some extent, you, you sort of do because that's how you learn what you do and don't like and the clients you do and don't jive with, right? But when you take on something that you can't deliver, then it's bad news, bad news from the start. And it's bad news for both of you eventually. And Alex advises to just skip it. And I agree. So his ABCD, A is for actionability, meaning is it actionable for you and your studio to achieve their needs? Is, it, is your firm in the right stage where you can deliver? So that's measuring up their expectations of when the project should happen versus your expectations of when you can do it, right? B is budget. We already know this can be an awkward conversation. 
right? We've had the conversations before here on the show on how to approach budget with a client. The budget conversation can be tricky, especially if the client doesn't know their budget. I like the way and Alex handled this entire part of the conversation. And if you have to rewind and listen, I highly encourage you to do that. But in the meantime, we do have other conversations on budget that have been on the show in the past that are very good ones as well. And I'll mention those. Terry Taylor, number 546. Sarah Magnus, number 3. 384 and Cheryl Clenenden number 482 and we will put the links to all of those in the show notes all coming from a different perspective but those each combined with what Alex said if you are struggling with how to have the conversation about budget I think by the time you listen to all of these like pretty much in like one sitting right in one week or whatever your brain will get flowing on what feels good for you right okay C is chemistry I love, I love, love, love that he isn't afraid to say no to clients, right? He said, take ourselves out of the running, right? I love that. Because he's right. You know from the start if it isn't a good fit. And that's when you have to be honest with yourself and move on. It gets easier to do it the more you do it successfully. I promise you. But you know the moment you do. Just listen to your inside voice. The good one, not the sassy one. Okay, now D, D is design. Is it a right project? And what is the criteria for being a right project? This goes back to knowing what you do, will do and what you will not do ahead of time, right? Alex has his criteria of what makes it a right project by design standards, but think about what are yours. Is it photo worthy? Is it in the right neighborhood? Is it right with the right builder? Is it a particular style of design that you you love to do. There's lots of different reasons why a project could be right from a design perspective. But the only reasons that matter are the ones that matter to you. So give yourself some time to think about why would, based on design alone, a project get a yay on the evaluation of it from a design standpoint, right? The whole idea of what Alex is doing is so that in order to provide the best client experience, you have to make sure that you're happy and that you're a good fit and they're a good fit for you in all the ways because this is at the core of a good client experience. You can have all the process, all the systems, all the beautiful design in the world, but if this, if it doesn't feel right from you to them or them to you or both of you at each other, then nothing is going to feel right. And that's what he's talking about. He's just got himself, I I almost want to say, you know, it's a level of business maturity, right? It's just understanding that, yeah, if this is also not right, then this whole thing could not be right. And to be okay with the no's and trust your intuition and your inside voice on knowing that. Okay. So I just love this conversation. Thank you, Alex, for sharing this incredible strategy. Totally love it. And I think it was very cute the way he said he cobbled his process by listening to a couple of podcasts like this one and others. I mean, that's incredibly humble of him, but I, you know what? You're not fooling me. You're a smart guy. And I know that a lot of work went into creating an intentional evaluative process so that by the end of even just one phone call with a client, you have a pretty good sense of if it's a yes or a no. And this is such an important tool to have in our own toolbox when we take our discovery calls, right? So thank you. Thank you, Alex. Appreciate it so much. Thank you tons for listening. Don't forget to check the show notes for all of the links of the things that we mentioned. Decide to be excellent. Thank you for joining me today. This podcast is a production of Luann Nigara Inc. If you want to know more about me, my books, or Luann University, go to luannnigara.com. And if you are interested in having Window Works help you with your next window treatment or awning project in the New York, New Jersey metro area, go to windowworksnj.com to learn more. Have an excellent day.